Okay, so in the last video, we talked about uh, how impulse responses are sort of derived using a vector autoregression model. And we went through sort of a brief example of how to interpret them. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the real business cycle model and what should be predicted by the real business cycle model and how that should theoretically imply the impulse response functions should be shaped, how they should be evolving over time. So, uh, well, without further ado, let's just uh, get started on this. So we know by this point how the real business cycle model should be responding to shocks because we looked at four different shocks. We looked at the technology shock, which was like the like the supply shock where there's this increase in technology, the increase in like productivity for a firm, well, the representative firm, but sort of at the aggregate that shifts the production function up and therefore it triggers a labor demand shock. The real wage rate goes up. Production obviously goes up. The aggregate supply curve shifts to the right along a downward sloping fixed demand, aggregate demand curve. And we see a reduction in prices and that leads to a reduction in the real interest rate. The labor supply shock shows a somewhat similar situation, except there's a shift in the labor supply curve. The production curve doesn't move at all. And because we have diminishing uh, marginal productivity of labor and capital, the increase in production is somewhat small. Therefore, there's going to be a smaller shift in the aggregate supply curve, which means a smaller reduction in the price level and a smaller reduction in the real interest rate. However, because the labor supply curve is shifting, right, what we're going to get is an reduction, I don't know why I said and reduction, a reduction in the real wage rate. So we're going to see similar signs, but there's like one thing that's a little different, and then the magnitude of the changes will be um, much smaller. The government spending shock, we'll see really no changes in real economic variables with the exception of the real interest rate. At, <clears throat> and then we will see an increase in the price level, however, because we have a perfectly inelastic aggregate supply curve or a vertical aggregate supply curve, there will only be a change in the price level. There will be no change in production. Therefore, if there's no change in production, it does not transmit back to any real variables like you know the wage rate, the amount of labor that's used, etc. And the monetary policy shock is completely in line with the predictions of monetary neutrality because this monetary policy shock leads to an increase in the money supply, increases well, the money supply reduces the real interest rate, shifts the aggregate demand curve out. However, because there is no change in production, right? There's no change in supply whatsoever. We end up having perfectly, um, my brain died. I don't know what the hell is going on with me today. Uh, we end up having a perfectly flexible response of prices. So all prices immediately respond. The LM curve kind of shifts back and we end up having no change whatsoever in any real economic variables. The money supply changed and the price level changed, which, as I said earlier, is consistent with the predictions of monetary neutrality. And we looked at how the economy responded to these shocks in the static framework. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at it in a dynamic framework. What would traditionally be done with this model is we would pull it up in like MATLAB or something. We would punch in all the equations for the equilibrium, we would calibrate it to, you know, have like a certain set of like initial conditions and um, certain parameters that would be evolving consistent with how we've observed them in the real world. And we would sort of let the computer generate all these, all the data that we need. We would impose these stochastic shocks at the equilibrium, and we would look at like model generated impulse responses. Um, that sounded like a bunch of gobbledygook to you. Um, don't worry, because I'm not doing any of that stuff. All that we're doing is we're just going to look at the VAR um, impulse responses, and we're going to compare that to what the theoretical predictions, just in terms of like the sign changes, are uh, with the static framework. That's It's more than enough to be able to understand whether or not this model is an adequate model at describing the real economy. So, yeah, we want to know if this model's any good because we can use models all day to give us predicted results, 
but we want to be able to compare that to real data because, yeah, living in this theoretical framework mindset for your entire life, that, that's awesome because it says you can do a lot of math and you can do a lot of computer programming. But that doesn't mean you need to be listened to for policy, right? There's no policy implications purely from theoretical models with no empirical evidence, right? We need theory to guide the empirical evidence, and we also need vice versa, right? We can't just rely solely on empirical evidence. We can't rely solely on theory. We need both. So this is why we would use a structural VAR, because we can use that existing economic theory from the real business cycle model and take the, the structure from the real business cycle model, namely the set of equilibrium conditions, and then tailor that to a VAR that's in its reduced form that's really, it's like a piece of clay. It's, it's malleable. We can do stuff with it. We can get it into a form that would be consistent with what the real business cycle model predicts. And if we do that, if we get it into that form, then we can hopefully derive impulse responses that are consistent with what the real business cycle model predicts. So the structural VAR or VAR allows us to put the actual real world data into a model that looks like the general equilibrium from the RBC model. Now, this was the set of general equilibrium conditions uh, for the most part. There's some stuff explaining this, the evolution of some of these stochastic shocks. I didn't put them in there, uh, but just if, if you ever want to go to graduate school for economics and uh, you go through a particularly rigorous um, macro first year sequence, you would see this plus a few other equations. If you don't do that, then, well, this is probably the extent that you will ever see of the equations in the real business cycle model. However, there are a few other equations that describe the evolution of the stochastic shocks over time. Now, these data generate shocks that allow me to trace out the equilibrium conditions of the real business cycle model. That's what I was talking about with like, you know, using MATLAB to program this stuff in and all that. So my first equation that we saw, right, equation one, that gives me production, which we can sort of think of as being able to get aggregate supply from that. The second gives me demand. Third is the Euler equation, it's consumption. Fourth is investment, the law of motion of capital. We had labor supply, labor demand, and the factor price of bonds. And we can use real world data. We can estimate a reduced form VAR and then we can impose some of the structure of the set of equations you saw to represent the equilibrium conditions of the RBC model. So I went out, got a bunch of data, put it into a VAR. The data came from the Federal Reserve Economic Database. The data are quarterly, and they span the fourth quarter 2008 up to the fourth quarter of 2019. I selected this data because it covers the quote-unquote unconventional monetary policy regime that followed the financial crisis of 2007-2008. Since this is a money and banking course, really it's kind of a focus on like monetary economics, um, so it's like a money course. Uh, well, there's still banking stuff too in there. Um, well, we're interested in monetary policy. We need to understand some of these other shocks as well to be able to tell the difference between them, but the main focus is the response of these things to monetary policy shocks. But the policy tools used by the Fed prior to the financial crisis were very different than what the Fed used after the financial crisis. So if I don't include, or if I fail to consider that there was that regime shift, well, I'm assuming a linear relationship in this VAR. Right, All the estimates are linear in parameters. I'm not, in doing so, I'm not allowing for any structural change, any regime shifts. So there's a little bit of a problem there because if I'm not assuming that, I'm assuming the relationships are identical before and after that. And so it's using like inappropriate data. So we would kind of have to look at stuff before up to like before the financial crisis up to the fourth quarter, really third quarter of 2008. And then we would have to look at a second regime after. Now, there are other types of VARs that allow us to kind of look at both over time. Um, and it was just seemed like a little too much to cover for this. I mean, honestly, this stuff is probably just a tad advanced anyways. I didn't need to make it worse.
Um, and I stopped it after the fourth quarter of 2019 because, well, I wanted to avoid the COVID-19 pandemic because, again, structural shift. There were major changes. So how do we translate all of that stuff into a model that we can estimate using real-world data? Well, we go out and get time series. What variables? Right, because we got If we go out and gather these time series data, right, they're variables that we're looking at. Well, we have to look at real GDP, personal consumption expenditures price index, consumption investment hours worked, wages, real interest rate, reserve balances, and these reserve balances, if you remember, are a component of the money base that the Federal Reserve directly controls. So let's review what happens in response to the shocks that we looked at in the RBC model. We're going to start with a TFP shock. This originates in the production function equation. Output increases become, because firms can produce more efficiently. Well, if they can produce more efficiently, right, it's like getting a new toy. If you want a new toy, you want to be able to play with that new toy more. Well, if you want to play with that new toy more, you need more time to be able to play with that, right? In the production sense of things, it means firms are making more stuff. They can produce more efficiently. They're going to need more labor. So this technology shock triggers a labor demand shock. Therefore, labor goes up, wages go up, output goes up. Now, when output goes up, that leads to a shift in the aggregate supply curve, meaning output goes up, prices fall. And then because that labor demand shock was triggered by the technology shock, hours worked and wages increase, and we have a reduction in the real interest rate. Now, I didn't show the real interest rate drop here because, um, well, it, it, it's kind of hard to get a lot of that stuff crammed into the screen. Um, so just remember that it happens in that ISLM graph that you saw. Um, and I don't know why I say you don't have to draw it. You do have to draw it. Um, just in this case, know that it falls. But when you look at like problem sets and stuff that I'll be posting, you will see that, okay, yeah, you know, you have to draw some of that stuff. So this is what we have. Now, remember, there would be a graph above the aggregate demand, aggregate supply space that would cover the ISLM. Remember the IS curve basically covers like fiscal policy shocks, and then the LM curve would cover monetary policy shocks. Take a wild guess which one I'm gonna be a little bit more interested in. But this is the technology shock. Everything in blue is what follows from the technology shock. And the technology shock originates in this graph here with a shift in this production function. Note, however, this production function pivots with a pivot point being in the origin. This production function does not shift up along this yt axis here, it is still at zero, zero. It's still at the origin. It's just pivoting out. Why is that? Well, we have something called the anodic conditions, where basically if we have, you know, zero of any input is just going to mean zero production. There's other stuff to it, but it's just, just consider it like that. So this is what we would get. Therefore, we would expect to see an increase in the wage rate, increase in labor, or reduction in unemployment, however you want to look at it, increase in output, reduction in prices, reduction in the real interest rate, and then probably not much of a change when it comes to the money supply because, well, if you remember the nominal GDP targeting stuff, there was that whole deal that you know monetary policy isn't really designed to deal with real shocks, only nominal shocks. Now, the labor supply shock, triggered either by an increase in the population, like, you know, holding reserve wage constant or a reduction in the reserve wage, holding the size of the labor force constant. This leads to a shock in the labor supply equation. Labor supply shifts out, hours worked increase, and the wage rate drops. But there's no change to technology, so there's no shift in the production function. So we're just moving to a new point on the existing production function that we have. There's an aggregate supply shift, but it's by a smaller amount than what we saw under the total factor productivity shock. And as I had said earlier in this video, it's consistent with diminishing marginal product of labor because the more labor you add to production, you're getting more production, but it's less productive. It's not adding as much as it was before. So this is what we would see here, right? There's no shift in this function here. There's a shift in the labor supply, wage rate drops, labor increases, but we're not really producing that much more. So there's a tiny shift in aggregate supply, therefore a tiny reduction in the price level and a tiny reduction up here in the real interest rate. So, okay, government spending shock. Government wants to spend more money to influence the business cycle. Well, they can spend more either by taxing or borrowing, which means consumers have less income to play around with and or investors have fewer loanable funds to play around with, right? It's likely gonna be a combination of the two. Rarely is it like all of one and none of the other.
So either way, the private sector has fewer units of output at their disposal. And because it causes a shift in the IS curve, the real interest rate increases and the aggregate demand curve shifts out. There is no change in technology under this shock to government spending because, well, government isn't anywhere in the production function, right? The production function is Y equals F of K and L. Well, K isn't government, L isn't government, right? Government is not an input in the production function. Therefore, they are not considered in the literature to drive innovation in the production process. Now, you could make you know, an argument for like a wartime case as a counterexample, but the government would have to either incentivize or mandate changes in production, which alters the resource allocation and isn't considered to be a truly exogenous shock to production. So government spending shock would look like this. Now remember, there's still the stuff up here you'd have to draw out, the ISLM stuff, the IS curve shifts out, and the LM curve is going to shift in, raising the real interest rate, and that's the only real variable that changes. The price level changes, and, well, there's no change in production. So that's just that. So now, finally, monetary policy shock. Let's suppose a central bank wants to increase the money supply to try to influence the business cycle. Well, there's a shock to the LM curve. Right, LM curve shifts out, lowers the real interest rate, aggregate demand curve shifts out, prices have to increase, so the LM curve shifts all the way back in, and the real interest rate increases back to where it was. So the nominal interest rate is going to decline, the price level is going to increase by the amount that the nominal interest rate declined, and therefore the real interest rate is left unchanged. Go through the Fisher equation, work it out, you will see what I'm talking about. So because prices are flexible and money is neutral, there's no change to output whatsoever, because all prices adjusted, meaning that output didn't have to. And this is what we would get here, right? The only difference between this and the monetary or the government spending shock is that here, the only variable that changes, aside from the money supply, is the price level. And in the government spending shock, the variable that did change was also the real interest rate. But we don't have any effects on real economic variables in response to a monetary policy shock, hence monetary neutrality. This is how monetary neutrality would work, right? This is what it would look like. So we're going to wrap up here by summarizing these, like, signed responses to these shocks. So go ahead and look through these. Um, I covered the first four. There's also the last one, which is the increase in expected inflation. We're not going to go through that. Um, a little bit more focused on the monetary policy responses um, because, well, where the rest of this course goes, we're going to be a little bit more focused on that monetary policy response. So I've got the source of the shocks, the type of shock, and then the qualitative responses, right? The signed responses, whether something goes up or down. So go ahead and take a look at these because this is going to be wildly useful for you to look at, well, when we need to start thinking about how these impulse responses are going to look, which is going to show up in the next video. So thank you for watching, and there will be another video coming along shortly.